In this video, I'm going to talk about the Zapata Peninsula and the fishing trip aboard the liveaboard boat Georgiana. The Zapata Peninsula is located not that far from Havana, to the south and east a bit, and on the southern shore of Cuba. It's bordered to the south by some famous fishing areas, from Island of the Youth to the southwest, all along the Canareos Archipelago, ending with Cayo Largo, which is almost directly south of the peninsula itself. The Zapata Peninsula is made up of almost uniquely sawgrass and mangroves, and it's really Cuba's version of the Everglades. It's the largest protected area in Cuba, and in fact the largest protected area in all of the Caribbean. It's popular with eco-tourists. They can come there and do jungle cruises and see the Cuban crocodile, and it's very popular with birders because there's a huge population of birds native to the area, and there's also a big migration of birds that visit the area, like a diversity of wading birds. Now, if wading birds can survive there in the salt water, brackish water, so can juvenile fish. And that's why we want to talk about this area, of course, and that it's, it's an amazing nursery for the fish that we love as fly anglers to grow up. So bonefish and snapper and tarpon will flourish in, the, in and among that um, area of mangroves and sawgrass as youngsters. And as they get big enough to venture out in the flats, they can because the whole peninsula itself is bordered to the south by an amazing expanse of flats and channels and islands and that's the area where Georgiana moors and has access to all this different fishing. The peninsula itself has no development of any kind. It's completely natural. Now just to the east of it are a couple of famous towns. They are Playa Hirón and Playa Larga. Both are located on the Bay of Pigs. Now the Bay of Pig conjures up a lot of um, memories historically, especially for Cubans and Americans. So let's have our history lesson for the day. The Cuban Revolution happened in 1959. That's when Fidel and his group of revolu revolutionaries took power. Two years later, there was an attempted invasion by a group of Cuban expatriates, Cubans that had left Cuba before and during the revolution, and their goal was to invade and overthrow Fidel, and they were backed by the U.S. government. In short, it failed miserably. Some were killed, the rest were captured, and it was a great victory for Fidel and cemented his position, and more interestingly, it helped move him either even further into allying with what was then the Soviet Union. Okay, let's get to talking about the logistics of the trip. So one of the nice things about Zapata is that it's pretty close to Havana, so generally that's where you're going to come through, almost always. In fact, the fishing trip starts on a Saturday afternoon, late in the day, and that's when you will meet the transportation to go down to Georgiana. So you have a couple options. One is you can arrive in Havana that day, making sure your flight's early enough to have time to be there for meeting the transportation. I generally ask people to arrive the day before, and I encourage them to do, to do so for a couple of reasons. The first is simply it takes that whole equation of travel worries out of your, um, out of your head. So any thoughts of uh, late flights or cancellations due to mechanicals or whatever, um, kind of are, are, are by the wayside. So I like that the fact that you can not have any stress about your travels. I also think it's great to spend some time in Havana. Whether you've been there or not, it's an interesting city and certainly for first timers to Cuba it's kind of a must see. It's Cuba's biggest city by far and it's certainly the one with the most history and the most culture. And 24 hours in Havana allows you to see a lot of different stuff. In any case, whichever way you do it, we're going to be met by transportation about 4 in the afternoon on the Saturday. And then you'll drive down to Zapata. The drive takes about 3 hours. I really, really like this drive. After spending time in Havana, you know, you'll be there in a big city and suddenly you'll now be in the Cuban countryside and the two are, boy, they are really different from each other. So suddenly you're going to be looking out the windows of the bus and seeing men tilling fields behind oxen and uh, people packed into horse-drawn carriages as they ride through villages. So I find it quite fascinating to see that um, side of Cuban life. You'll ultimately pass through the small town of Playa Larga, which is on the Bay of Pigs. And shortly after that, you'll be at the marina where Georgiana is moored. And so you're going to board the boat and get all um, uh, acquainted with it. And you'll spend the night in port there. So that night you'll have time to uh, find your room, stow your gear, actually put fishing gear together if you want to. You'll get a briefing about the boat and how it works. And you'll have dinner, of course, aboard the boat. And the reason for this, by the way, is that the guys need a little bit of time off. So they've ended their previous week on Saturday morning. So they've got that afternoon and evening to spend with their families, and they're going to meet you the next day on the flats. 
So you spend the night there, and uh, let's talk a little bit about Georgiana and how the, um, the boat is, is uh, put together and its amenities. Now, Georgiana is one of the older boats that's in the fleet of liveaboards. No, no question about that. That doesn't mean it's not comfortable, because it is. It has six cabins for guests and it maxes out at groups of eight. So that generally means that four people are gonna have rooms to themselves and four people are gonna share the other two rooms. Generally, it all works out great because we almost always have a father and son or married couples or buddies that have come on the trip together and they're fine uh, rooming in one of those double rooms. In any case, all of the rooms have their own bathroom and their own shower. They all have unlimited fresh water because you've got desalinization tanks aboard the boat. The boat itself is really spacious. There's a couple areas you kind of need to know about. The aft area of the boat where you step onto the, uh, the boat after fishing is where you're going to store all your gear. The uh, deckhands generally will take rods and reels from you, rinse them off, and stow them. You put flats, boots back there, and fanny packs and all that stuff that you need for your next day's fishing. Accommodations are downstairs, and then the whole upstairs is kind of the common area and where you'll um, take your meals. There's an aft area up there, which is where everybody hangs out. So after fishing, generally, this is where you're going to have a mojito, maybe smoke a cigar, uh, have an appetizer before dinner, and just shoot the breeze about how things went that day. And then the dining area is next to that. I've mentioned before in other videos that the food in Cuba is not well thought of, and that's for, for good reason. It's not because there's a lack of effort. It's simply because there's not um, an abundance of great supplies in Cuba. That said, the outfitter does an amazing job aboard these boats, and you really have everything you need as a customer. All the drinks you'd want, sodas and, and uh, lots of water, and beer and wine, and hard alcohol, and then a really great assortment of food. So here's just sort of a little preview to that. Breakfast generally are eggs to order, fresh fruit, fresh uh, fruit juice, um, ham, and cheese, and um, fresh bread. Lunches you can either have on board the boat. You can come back in your skiff and kind of relax and have a lunch on board the boat. Most people have the staff pack a lunch for them and they take it with them. And those lunches generally are rice and then um, some sort of a meat and vegetable dish and fresh fruit on the side. And then dinners are quite a production. There's a lot on the table here. So lots of different rice dishes, lots of fresh vegetables, and certainly an abundance of meat dishes from chicken and pork and even maybe a, a night where they barbecue for you to lots of fresh seafood, fish and lobster and, um, and shrimp as well. I want to talk a little bit about the staffs aboard the boats. The staffs are all Cuban nationals. So that means that your fishing guides are all Cuban and the people aboard the boat working on the boat are all Cuban as well. And the, the staff is usually made up of a captain, an engineer, a cook, some deckhands, and a hostess. And what I really, really like about these week-long liveaboard boats is that you as a customer, you really get to know these people. In fact, you'll probably become friends with some of them and you'll talk to them on Facebook after your trip. But for us as people who are visiting Cuba, it gives us a chance to know a lot more about their lives and what life in Cuba is really like. And it's very interesting and I think one of the great benefits to this sort of trip. So I just love that. The next morning, you're going to be woken up early because the boat's going to leave port early. And it's going to venture across the Bay of Pigs. It's going to border the shallow water of the flats and then enter kind of a deeper, deeper area where the boat will actually set anchor and where it's going to moor for the week. And as you arrive, you'll see a bunch of skiffs heading towards you because the guides have made their way out there and you're going to join them for your first day of fishing. So you'll get six days of fishing around Zapata. Now that first day is a little bit shorter than the others just because you've got to get out there. So that shortens the day by an hour or two. But in those six days, one thing that's really unique about this fishery is that unlike other areas where every day you share a skiff with somebody else, here in Zapata you have three days where you're in a double skiff, like normal, and three days when you're in a single. And it's fantastic. Think about what that means. That means that for three days, Every second of the day that you're out there is for you. You get to do all the fishing. You don't have to share any of that time. The other thing that's nice about it from an angler's perspective is that you get to choose exactly what you do. If you're into permit fishing, you can fish permit all day long. If you want to wade fish, you can wade fish all day long. Again, you don't have to consider anybody else's uh, wants or needs. Now, the reason for this is that the shallow water flats are expansive and they're quite shallow and it's very hard for a bigger boat with um, three people in it 
two customers and a guide to get through that water and not get stuck and that's why they do it this way. So on the days where you're in a double, you'll generally be fishing deeper water and that means those days are mostly tar targeting tarpon or they're fishing deeper flats where you might find um, uh, bigger bone fish and permit. And when you're in a single skiff, well, you can kind of do anything that you want to, but a lot of times you're going to be on the shallow water flats looking for bonefish or permit. So let's talk about the, the different fish that are here. The first thing to really understand is that all species of flats fish exist here every month of the year. So let's start up, start up by talking about bonefish. No question about it, Zapata is really known for having a prolific population of bonefish and there are a lot of bonefish here and they range in size from really small guys that are just fresh out of the mangroves to double digit fish no question about it so you see a little bit of everything but you get a lot of shots and you also can do a lot of waiting here so if you really chose to spend the whole day waiting you could if you're smart about it though you would let your guide tell you when you're going to want to get back in the boat and have opportunities for bigger fish maybe in slightly deeper water or softer flats the tarpon fishing here is pretty darn dependable i would say there's so much great habitat for tarpon and as i've said in other videos tarpon uh, grow up in and among the mangroves and they want to stay in, in and around those mangroves until they get to about 30 pounds or so when they reach sexual maturity and they join the migration. And uh, there are tarpon in amongst all of this habitat in the mangroves, in channels in the, in the mangroves, in back bays in the mangroves, and along beaches that are mangrove lined on these different islands. So there's a tremendous um, amount of habitat. And you really, you can hook tarpon every, every day here. Now, unlike Gardens of the Queen or Island of the Youth, there's not a huge influx of migratory fish here in the spring and early summer. Certainly, some bigger fish show up, but it's not one of those things you can really depend on like you can in some of those in the other areas. So in May or June, you might find some 40 or 50 pound fish around, but it's kind of the, the anomaly rather than the norm. The permit fishing in Zapata, I think, is some of the best permit fishing in all of Cuba in terms of sheer number of fish. There are a lot of permit here. Now, I would say on average, they're a bit smaller than they might be in places like Cayo Largo or Cayo Cruz, but there really are a lot of fish here and it gives you a great um, opportunity at chances to fish for them. And like the other species, like bonefish, for example, there's a great diversity of habitats that you'll find them in. So you might find them in the outside beaches, the oceanside beaches over light sand, but there's a lot of back country here that's just Man, it's perfect for permit. In amongst the mangroves with softer, dark bottoms, and boy, you can see a lot of fish. It's really important to have the right flies here. Crab flies are super important, and flies that are generally are darker profile to uh, match these darker bottoms. Now, like Gardens of the Queen, this area around Zapata is really healthy, and it means that all the other flat species exist here as well. So think about snook and think about jacks and snapper and um, grouper etc so bring one of those fly boxes that's full of your generic flies so bring clouser minnows and deceivers and poppers and the like and it's important to maybe have a sink tip line along for this trip because there's a lot of opportunity for you to blind cast into channels and blue holes and really uh, catch some interesting fish so in summary, Zapata is a pretty special place, and I would say there are maybe three or four things that make it special. One is that it's one of the easier places for you to access on a fishing trip to Cuba. You come through Havana, and then it's a pretty short trip to get down to where you meet Georgiana. The second is, in comparison to some of the other destinations of Cuba, it can be a little bit less expensive. That does depend on the time of year, but that's just kind of a generalization, is that it can be slightly less expensive. One of the other reasons that it's so special is what we just talked about, the fact that you get three days where you can fish just by yourself, which means a lot more fishing time. And lastly, this is a special area because all species of flats fish exist there every day of the year. So no matter your preference, if it's permit or tarpon or bonefish, you can do them all day long, or you can go out and catch just whatever fish are available at any time of day and have a blast doing it. So Zapata is quite a special place.